Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective. In today's episode, we travel over to Chiefland, Florida to interview Captain Lacey Kelly, who guides fishing and hunting trips with Florida Outdoor Experience. Lacey grew up in South Florida in a family that taught her to love and cherish the outdoors, and she began guiding in Fort Myers, Florida, spent a season of life chasing permit in Belize, and eventually made her way to Florida's nature coast, fishing along areas like Cedar Key and Homosassa. In today's episode, we dive into her background and upbringing, her experience as a guide, and have a very open conversation about her challenges and hopes as a female in the fishing industry. As always, if you're enjoying this podcast, please continue to spread the word and share. Thank you for listening. This is the Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. Uh, yeah, he, he, right. tried he tried to eat it. He tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. He got him. He's on. Got uh, two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's, you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the, he's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. Anytime, I said, you talk so much, you're like a senator. Hey, Lacey, thanks for joining us on the podcast. I think the last time I was down here at FOE, you were sponging. Is that what was going on in the keys? No, 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 I was lobstering. (laughs) Okay. I didn't know if you were, if you guys were doing some sort of commercial work with your family or. Yeah. So my dad has a a commercial um, saltwater products license and we commercial lobster every year. So I was down there doing that with the family. (laughs) The full speed in a bunch of different directions as far as hunting, fishing, fly fishing, lobstering. Oh Um, yeah. You get, I mean, it's not fair just to do one. Yeah. (laughs) Well, as we kind of start here, I'd love just to hear about your story. And I know your family just played a huge role in in your love for the outdoors and how you came through this winding path that led you to Chiefland and where we are today, the Florida Outdoor Experience. Sure. I never thought I'd get here. I didn't even know what Chiefland was or where it was, um, essentially, until I came up here to do an article. So uh, it's, it's a cool spot in the world and definitely has my heart. As far as um, taking me back to old Florida and Mm -hmm. what that looks like as far as the changes that I've seen growing up um, in a very rural area that is now becoming incredibly developed. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, um, it's refreshing. I have a hard time going home now. Like, for example, my parents live out what we considered out when I was a kid it took 45 minutes just to get to so-called town, you know, to a gas station. We live off a dirt road and they still live off a dirt road. But now that dirt road, as you approach it to the left, there's 900 homes going up and to the right, there's 700 homes going up. And that's up. Fort Lauderdale? Um, no, it's Estero, Florida. Okay. So I grew up in Fort Myers, um, fifth generation Fort Myers. Okay. And what was kind of your first step into the outdoors as a kid? Probably just my first step. (laughs) (laughs) It's just been a way of life. Like when I was six months old, I was on the boat lobstering. Obviously, I wasn't able to lobster at that point, but my parents never left us um, out of it. Whatever they were doing in the outdoors, we were incorporated into it. it. And Oftentimes growing up, I've heard people ask advice um, to my parents, you know, well, we can't go fishing or we can't do this because the kids and they're not Mm -hmm. old enough. And we were just submersed. My brother and I, we didn't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it, it was always just something that we did as a family entirely. And it, it just became, it's just a natural thing for me. I, I don't know if there was ever any incredibly like starting point per se. And that was why I mentioned earlier. I just, I thought it was interesting because I knew off the gate just or off the bat, you know, you're doing hunting and fishing and that's kind of uncommon, you know? And then on top of that, you know, I come down and I'm like, Oh, maybe, you know, Lacey will be here. And then it's like, no, no, I also do commercial lobstering. And has it always for you just been a lot of variety? I mean, when you were a kid, did you guys do a lot of different outdoor stuff or did you tend just to stick to 
lobstering and spearfishing? Well, anybody that knows my father knows that he is a, a jack of all trades as far as in the outdoors. Um, from mainly spearfishing was his passion. I would say that that's his favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but the, we did so much more. You know, he has always had his uh, saltwater products license since I was a kid. So we commercial spearfished just to pay the bills in order to be able to go to spearfish, essentially. Um, and then it, you know, from there, he's just kind of, it's like his formula that he's always kind of done. And at times, just like in any commercial fishing, you're going to have times where it's flush and then you're going to have years, you know, due to nature that it's, it's not. So, um, we, we did everything and anything that you could probably think of that you could do in the outdoors in Florida, hunting and fishing wise yeah. and spear fishing. As a kid, was there something that you gravitated more towards? Oh, I love being underwater. I really do. I, I would say that that's, you know, probably my first passion. I love, I love just the peace and the serenity that you get underwater, mm -hmm. which is different. Um, I think you find that also in hunting, especially um, that quietness you know, whereas my guiding is is obviously you're interacting with the client um, or if you're just out on the boat with a friend, flats fishing or just fishing in general, that's more of a social sport. Um, so I like I like the solidarity of being quiet, um, being at peace. Hunting isn't just about killing something. It's also a, a meditative state for me to let everything else stop in the world and just be quiet. And it's amazing where your mind goes at that point um, and where it doesn't go. And sometimes just that quiet space is, is what we need. And especially in this day and age where it's so easy just to, you know, wake up and go right to your phone and start scrolling through Instagram or social media mm -hmm. and catch up on the news. And we have so much clutter all of the time. So I, I look to those spaces to, to regenerate and kind of refresh. Even as a kid, you, you felt that way? I'm sure, yeah. yeah. And it, it's, but I grew up It would drive country, me crazy as so a kid, yeah. So I, I, I grew up um, inland on acreage and we had a really cool pond that we swam in every day. Um, you know, I was just constantly entertaining myself outdoors. You know, obviously I played with my brother and there just weren't many kids in our neighborhood, we lived in a rural area, so there were only a few kids that we could play with, period. And, you know, I think I spent probably a lot of time doing outdoors things that I didn't even realize would mold me into, you know, who I am today. And Just I, I had a location. similar kind of up, upbringing as far as being out. My, I lived on some land that my dad patrolled when he was working for the Fish and Wildlife Commission. Mm -hmm. But for me, one of the challenging things, I just remember being a kid and I, the patience and the alone aspect I didn't like as a kid and I still I think it's a personality thing but you know I remember totally. the first time I ever sat in a tree stand alone and I was like I was bored you know but now as an adult I've totally changed on that but it, you you're saying even as a kid like you just you had that reverence for well for that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ask my parents there I was a I was a hyper kid I mean I was active I was extremely social um my brother's very introverted. I would say I'm more extroverted. And then I have that introverted side where I, I like, maybe it's more so in my adulthood that I, I appreciate the quiet more. Um, but I was wild. I mean, my dad had to play cards with me. I remember like my first year that I shot, you know, he was constantly like feeding me candy, playing cards. I mean, I while was, you guys like waited after or, or why you were hunting, hunting. Okay. And I, I remember shooting my first doe mm -hmm. and I looked over at him and I said, can I shoot another one? <laughs> and he's like, no, absolutely not. Let's go recover greedy. this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I was definitely a hyper kid as far as like just energetic, like just constantly into everything. So. Yeah. But you're still kind of energetic today because <laughs> you you, we that. joke about yeah. how many hats that you wear. You know, you're, you're in a lot of different things and you're involved in a lot of... tired now. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> but it, it is interesting to think about 
um, with all the busy busyness that life can bring, how there can still be this childlike peace that comes from being alone in the deer stand or underwater, or even if you are with a quiet client. Oh, for pulling sure. Pulling them both. Because in some ways, like being on the pulling platform is kind of like being in a tree stand, I guess. I don't think, I don't think any of my clients would say that I'm quiet. <laughs> we talk the entire day. And it, th- you know, that's one thing that's different about being a girl guide versus um, mm-hmm. being a guy guide. You know, oftentimes I'll look over and see Gray or, you know, Brian or, you know, Parker, one of our other guides, you know, that are fishing alongside of me. And I'm over here, da, 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 da. <laughs> and they're very, uh, very quiet, probably not even saying anything. So I, I think there's a difference um, in I have a need to like want to get to know my clients. I want to know everything about you. I want to feel like we're great friends by the end of whether it's the end of the day mm-hmm. or the end of the three days that I'm fishing them or five days or whatever it may be. So. Um, we joke, especially um, hunting, when I'm guiding hunting, like turkey hunters, for example, you have to be extremely quiet. But there are times where maybe you're set up in a, a tent blind because it's raining and you can be a little bit more vocal. And um, well, I've had a few guys joke after the fact, like, oh, we're just sitting there having girl talk. And mm-hmm. here came the Osceola and I shot the bird and blah, blah, blah. So I definitely think that as a girl guide, you tend to probably chatter a little bit yeah. more than you, maybe you need to per se. Yeah. Well, guys can sometimes just be really intense. And then I think just, I know there's some stereotype there, so I don't want to throw too big of a stereotype out, but I do think that there's just a, a lot of times men just aren't as comfortable opening up with people out the gate, you know? And so you're on the boat with somebody and if you have two best friends on the boat, they're probably going to be giving each other a hard time and talking and asking about wives and kids and but, you know, on the most part, I think there's there's a level that there's a little bit more maybe of a wall that guys have. You Certainly. Know? And um, it's easier for me to pull that information out or not pull, but just yeah. it flows better, I guess you could say. And so you're a kid and you're 100 miles an hour. You're doing lobstering and hunting and fishing. And then at what point do you decide, I think I want to do this with my life vocationally? So... I was in college at FGCU. I stayed at home. I was tinkering and going to FAU, but ended up staying at home. Um, I was dual enrolled during high school, very active um, as far as like social stuff, you know, class president, all that sort of thing. Um, and I, I kind of got tired of, of running around and, and just being involved in everything. I guess. So my college was a really, my college experience was really quiet. FGCO just opened. We didn't have any activities really per se. There were still hogs like and gators like walking across the sidewalk as you were walking into class because it, it was built, you know, in a preserve area. So it was, um, a time for me to kind of change pace, I think. And I was at the time I was working at the Hyatt, um, waitressing, And I had moved around into the departments in the Hyatt and I thought, well, maybe I'll just focus on getting my, um, my degree in hospitality and tourism management. So I kind of leaned that way, but I still really wasn't satisfied in that, you know, like when you just kind of don't know what you're calling quite as yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I got married young to a fishing guide and I started to run his business while I was still in school. And after a while, I was like, I'm perfectly capable of doing all this. I've been running. I had a, a boat since I was 16 at an old aqua sport that my grandpa gave my dad t- to my brother and I to use. So I was throwing a boat in at 16 years old by myself, going fishing by myself. So I had no problem, you know, with some of the steps. I think that it's th- the steps that seem so scary for a woman mm-hmm. to get into it. So it just kind of happened. Like I was like, I could do this. I'm going to go get my captain's license. Like, I'm going to be a female guide. Like, yeah. this is going to be great. Did so it occur just, to you that that was unique, or did you really not think about it that much? I didn't even think about it because I've never really, my dad's never really separated the fact that I was a girl and mm-hmm. all of it. I mean, I was right there in the middle of everything that we did outdoorsy. So 
we, he never like was like, oh no, you can't do this or let your brother do that. Like my dad's always encouraged me to, hmm. to jump right in. Like, oh, we're going to go, you know, shoot hogs with spears or throw spears. Like, okay, here we go. <laughs> like that's <laughs> normal it's just, girl, dad stuff. <laughs> to- totally. <laughs> so yeah. he's always just treated me like I was an equal. So I never really had um, maybe any hesitation with it. It was just like, I can do that. Yeah. I want to be on the water every day. Well, and it's not every day that you see a 16 year old girl in an aqua, aqua sport <laughs> going around fishing. But I think in some ways, maybe, I don't, I don't know if sheltered's the right word, but he maybe sheltered you a little bit from just all the stereotypes or how maybe unique that was. Like if you didn't know any different, it might, might've actually been better that way. Probably. Yeah. I, you know, I had never really thought about it you until wouldn't just now. feel like you were a, a rule breaker. Like you were breaking some sort of rule because I mean, anytime right. somebody feels, and I, and I think about this, so I have a daughter on the way and I, I have a three-year-old who we talked about earlier this morning, but she's just, she's obsessed with sharks and she loves the ocean. And she just, she, she, but I think she's like most kids, you know, she, she loves her daddy and she wants to be with her dad and she wants to do things that, that our family does. And she also, we talked about this, that, you know, it's not a unique thing. If you take a three-year-old out into the wild and you start to show them fish or dolphin or hogs or whatever, they're going to be captivated by it. They're going to be, there's a natural draw we have as humans to it. hundred percent. Girl, boy, white, black, doesn't matter. Exactly. You know? Um, and, and. I think that for you, maybe it was a good thing that you just experienced that and you didn't realize how maybe different or atypical it was. I didn't really realize, too, how lucky I was that, you know, I just got submersed in all of this naturally. It was just a way of life for my family. You know, hunting and fishing was a sustenance thing. It wasn't, it was also very enjoyable. Um, I know my dad said that my great grandfather, um, we were just talking about old times just this last week. And he said every time he was a hard worker, a farmer, but every time one of our other relatives came and asked him if he wanted to go hunting, he quit what he was doing, no matter what the job was. Mm-hmm. And he packed his stuff and he went every single time. So I think I get a little bit of that, you know, just naturally through my blood per mm-hmm. se, but just like you, you know, brought up that it, when you show it to a kid and they're, they have a clean slate, they have no preconception of what should be or what shouldn't be and, and any of the stereotypes that they're just looking at it through a child's eyes. And I think I still look at it through a child's eyes. I don't, I don't look at it like this isn't something that I got into to make a name for myself or to be something necessarily like to be some revered guide I'm always gonna hunt and I'm always gonna fish and I always did that before I was a guide and I'll always do it Mm -hmm. you know if I I quit guiding you know that's just who I am Mm -hmm. not it's not so much something that I've you know fallen into or you know picked up from somebody else you know which there's nothing wrong with that either you know it but it's for me it's just natural Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to explain it. It's just what I do. (laughs) And I think that just the fact that you can even say that, that you've kept that childlike, you know, being able to see it through a child's eyes has been critical because even when people don't accept you or, or just maybe look and say, Oh, she's less legit. You know, it's a girl. Oh, it's, I mean, I remember guiding when I first started guiding and none of them would talk to me hardly at all. Like walking down the dock and I was a guide out of Punarasa and which is a public boat ramp that a lot of guides use in Fort Myers. And it took a couple of years before anyone really even had any sort of like solid conversation with me or even gave me the time of day. Mm-hmm. You know, it was kind of like I got the cold shoulder for years from certain guides and then some were easier, you know, yeah. to kind of become friends with yeah. down the road. But It wasn't easy. Like at first I was definitely looked at as, well, I can't believe she's charging as much as we do Mm -hmm. to do what we're doing the same thing. And it's, yeah. And some of them aren't talkative anyway. No. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I I think the stereotype is, you know, I mean, this isn't really breaking any new ground here for anybody, but is that 
females or female guides aren't as legit because the assumption is that when you know they they don't think that oh Lacey was 16 years old in a 16 foot aqua sport going out and learning the water they think that no Lacey was probably painting her nails and campaigning for prom queen and you which know, I was all the boys I was doing here. that too <laughs> so. <laughs> you just but I I do think that it's it's you know, as a girl dad, and I'm really solidifying myself in that space, kind of like Greg yeah. <laughs> with the second one coming. All I want, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but all I want is just for my daughters to have the opportunity. If that's what they want to do, then they get to do it and they can just be, they can have the same experience that a boy would have. And if if they're good, then they'll get the respect of being good. And if they're casual and recreational, they'll be recreational. That's fine. And that's fine. They're, they're, there's room for everyone. And that's what's mm-hmm. so cool about hunting and fishing and just outdoors life in general is that you know, no matter what you look like, no matter, you know, what size you mm-hmm. are, what color you are, what gender you are, like there's room for everyone. Mm-hmm. We and the fish enough, don't care. And the fish but don't care. I think the acceptance piece is really hard because, you know, you talk about when you first started guiding, how old were you? I was, I think I was 21 or two, 21, 22. So that's pre before social media was really running everything. Oh, it was definitely before social media. You know, people weren't talking, talking, I'm using air quotes, talking to you at the dock or maybe somebody to make a mean comment or whatever. But now the dock is bigger because of social media. It's a, it's a, it's a theoretical dock that is online world where it used to just be, am I accepted? Do I have community with the other guides that share the same little ramp and space as me? But now that's gotten even bigger. And I do think that there can be a distraction that comes from, am I accepted? What do people think? Do they think I'm legit? Who cares? Go catch a redfish, you know? I felt that, I finally felt that personally um, coming to guide here Hmm. because I, you know, I was a very successful guide in Fort Myers for many years and I left and ran a fly shop in Belize for like three years. And when I came back, I had never anticipated what it was really going to be like to start all over in a new fishery and have to learn everything, you know, hat in hand, like firsthand and, and not have, not have necessarily like the, the acceptance of the other guides because Mm -hmm. none of them knew me. And a lot of them still don't know me even in the area that I fished. Mm -hmm. I'm still kind of under the radar. There was, definitely a few years in Homosassa that even like the dock hands and stuff didn't even know that I was guiding out of there. Mm. And I liked it that way because I, I was the new guide and I didn't want to step on any toes. And then about year three, it was like, oh, you're so-and-so. Mm-hmm. I'll follow you on Instagram. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> like it's now I've opened that up that whole can of worms and deep down inside when you start over and you and you go to a new fishery and i think you ultimately want to be accepted not only by your peers but respected and it and it takes years and it takes a lot of blood sweat and tears to mm-hmm. get there and i think that instagram and the social media train doesn't really um allow people to see that vulnerable side Mm -hmm. of of somebody and it's totally different it's it's definitely i think given me the opportunity to start with a fresh clean slate like nobody really knows me around here Mm -hmm. let's see what i can do with it and see if i can earn that respect um from them firsthand just seeing me out there and doing my thing and and catching fish and putting fish to hand and i think that's it's, it's kind of scary at first, really, mm-hmm. but you get over that and you have to have thick skin. You have to have thicker skin, I, I feel like, even as a female than guys do because you're going, you have to work twice as hard to get to where you want to be to earn that respect. And the nature coast up here is, it's almost like traveling back in time. I mean, it's just, a, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not, it's not a, a, booming metropolis or anything by any means but you (laughs) went to belize for three years and you worked at a fly shop ran a fly shop and you were involved in that community and culture in what ways was that different than here and then also in what ways did that help help you understand like when you talk about figuring out a fishery and learning a culture and working to get embraced what were some of the differences that you saw there so i remember 
when I first, like, the first time that I went there was on a Sims photo shoot. And I was primarily a conventional guide at the time, but I would take, you know, 20 or so fly trips a year. I was not by any means just a fly only kind of guide. And I, when I got there, um, over the course of like the seven days, I realized that none of the women really fish over there. Hmm. Like none, of, they might go out, maybe do some like reef fishing. Did they act like they've, did you think they've, they like, were you deceived? Did you feel? No, no, but I just, I never really thought, thought that that it. was possible. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I grew up in Florida, like. Everyone's fishing. Everyone's yeah. fishing, you know, but that's just a part of our life. Like you, it, there wasn't such a distinction, distinction in Florida. So when I got there, I remember some of the guides at the dock, like kind of make, making fun or like being like, oh, gal, you can't throw that cast net. Mm-hmm. And I'm like. In the Bahamas? In or, Belize. Sorry, in Belize. Yeah. yeah in Belize. And I'm like, okay, like, let me show you something. Mm-hmm. And they were just blown away that, for one, that I was even a guide. Mm-hmm. That people got on my boat and I took them fishing. And for two, like, the, it's the culture thing there. They they just don't really, the, the women there don't really get involved with mm-hmm. the outdoorsy, you know, parts even though it's the caribbean and everybody's outdoors per se but they're not out there trying to learn how to fly fish for example like i i only knew one other person there and she ran a lodge that was a female fly fisher like there wasn't anyone there to relate to as far as like hey you want to go fishing with me tomorrow let's go walk the beach and go catch some bonefish on fly It, it was unheard of and it It'll be a long time there before it ever gets there. Mm. Per Do se. you feel like they're behind? Oh gosh, yeah. yeah okay, but I lived on I, an island yeah. too. I lived in San Pedro. I don't know. I, I guess I thought so. an island would be more. I don't know. Just laid back. At, I don't know. Everybody fishing, but you're saying Th- they no. fish for food, mm-hmm. you know, but n- not like sport fishing yeah. or like into the, you know. Yeah, they're not out there fly fishing for permit. No, definitely <laughs> yeah. not. So the cultural difference was interesting to see for sure well how did that help you though when so you you uproot from fort meyer area and then you go over to belize and then now you come over to here very different but how did that help prepare you for what you did experience when you came into this new fishery and you were trying to get established and build community and figure out the the fishery i had such a um an appreciation for being able to guide again because when i lived in belize i couldn't guide you have to be a citizen of belize Mm -hmm. which takes roughly around six years and even then you might not even get your citizenship so um i couldn't even run a boat over there legally they i wasn't a resident i was just on a you know visitor's visa essentially so um i felt like i always had the handcuffs when i was there i was limited to you know, walking the beaches if if I wasn't going out with another guide mm-hmm. or the fly shop owner on his boat. But I was very limited in what I could do that I loved to do. Yeah. So when I came back here, I was like, oh gosh, I got the keys. I got a boat. Yeah. I have a truck. I can go fish. I can do whatever I want to do. And I don't have that limitation. So I think it, um, it made me incredibly grateful for that experience and knowing what it's like to not be able to do it. And it would be very similar to somebody that's aspiring to be a guide that can't afford necessarily to get a boat, but maybe they've run their dad's boat or, you know, or, or a family members and they, they want so badly to be there, but they're not there yet. So that's kind of, do you feel like it taught you patience? Definitely. Cause I, I was, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I was a very successful guide and, and somewhat known in my little clique of guides, just like anywhere in in F- Florida or really any kind of fishery per se, um, and respected. So like when I went over there, I was like, oh well, girls don't do this. <laughs> you're, and you're like, oh no, I have you? to start again. Yeah, yeah. like who? And and that was okay. I'm I'm a I'm I want to be incredibly humble. Mm-hmm. I always want to walk into any situation knowing that I don't know everything and not try to be something that I'm not. So um, I'll be the first person to say 
you know, you asked me some technical question that I may not know the answer to, but you, you probably think I should, I'll be the first person to say that I'm not an incredibly type A guide. I'm not the guide that has all their leaders tied out, you know, in the stretcher box mm -hmm. for turban season. I'm more of the... That is so homosassa. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm the, oh, I got this. I think I put this fly in my pocket. Which pocket's it in? And I'm, I'm like scuffling around trying to find it. And I find it and we hook a, hook a fish and put it to hand. So I'm, I'm definitely can admit that I'm not, um, I am organized, but it's kind of like organized chaos a oh, little yeah. bit. I'm one of those guides. But I'm sure it was frustrating getting over there and just feeling like you had those handcuffs. What was more frustrating, though, trying to chase down permit or just some of the cultural things? Both, because I felt like <laughs> if I had a boat, I could go permit fishing more yeah. often. But I was limited to only really doing that like one day a week, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have all this pressure because you have goals in your mind. Like mine was to catch as many permit as I could on fly. It still is. It's still a huge part of like something that burns inside of me. So when you're limited to that and you that's all you have, you put a lot of pressure on yourself when the moment comes and it's very easy to unravel. And that's something that I try to prep my clients for, especially when they come to fly fish for tarpon with me because they've waited you know, maybe they've booked, like right now, I have clients that have booked for next year that are practicing all year to get on my bow, to put that fly in front of the fish's face and make everything work, all the moving parts happen in order to be successful. And it's, if you put too much pressure on yourself, it's, I think it's far easier to crumble when the chaos ensues mm -hmm. and, and tarpon fishing and permit fishing, fly fishing, saltwater in general, for the most part, and especially those two species can be very chaotic, can be a total Chinese fire drill. You know, the lines wrapped around your leg or your ear, your hat, or, you know, mm -hmm. it, there's so many things that can go wrong and it happens within a matter of seconds and you can beat yourself up about it, but, mm -hmm that's not the answer. Beating yourself up about it, not having this picture in your mind that you went on a tarpon trip and you didn't catch a tarpon on fly, that's not, that's not a, a outlook I think that will continue to make you successful in the sport. Mm -hmm. You've gotta go into it like, okay, what am I going to learn today? What did I take away from that? What do I need to pay attention to the next time I definitely don't need to have my line just kind of laying around the deck. And one of the first things that I need to do is check that. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a, it's a puzzle. And, and saltwater fly fishing is definitely a puzzle. So putting all those puzzle pieces together takes years. And it takes some people longer than others. I've never been good at something right out the gate. I have to work hard, whether, you know, trying to play sports or fly fishing or hunting. I've always had to work hard to get there. So I wasn't just naturally, you know, blessed with the most perfect eye hand coordination. Now, my best friend, who's an Olympic volleyball player, she's blessed with mm -hmm. natural eye hand coordination. <laughs> every sport that we played growing up, she just smoked everybody and it didn't matter what it was. I was never like that. So having to put all those puzzle pieces together and also, like take the little building blocks to create something that will lead into the next thing with mm -hmm. it is, is important. And you just can't look at it like, well, I didn't catch a tarp in that trip. It wasn't a successful trip, but it very well could have been because all of the things that you learn on that trip will make you successful in your next trip. And, and keeping that kind of mindset, I think is important. And so you start in Fort Myers and then you end up in Belize and you do that for three years. You're working, you're involved in that community and then you move to Chieflin. Yes. Tell me about how that came to be. And then also like how that's shaped you to who you are today, just being a part of the FOE 
guide group? Sure. So when I was in Belize, um, you know, I, I was laser focused on permit and in order to practice for permit, you catch a lot of tailing bonefish. Um, that was one thing that the fly shop owner will definitely preach. So I caught a lot of bonefish. All I did was fly fish. I fly mm. fished every single day, every morning that I woke up, I went out and cast on the dock. And one thing that you hear Gray talk about is the 10,000 hour rule. And it's, it's definitely something that I believe in. So I submerged myself, immersed myself in fly fishing for that extended period of time. But something that was missing, which is a huge part of my life. And when I was guiding um, full time in Florida, when I wasn't guiding, I was in the woods. And I lived off the land just like my parents lived off the land. So I ate venison. I mean, I don't even remember hardly ever buying mm -hmm. any sort of other red meat. Like I ate venison, mm -hmm. like we ate so much venison. So I was constantly hunting. I was in the woods, I wasn't spending much money. I was living charter to charter, you know, and then living off the land or the, you know, the sea essentially and providing for myself. So when I came back, I would come back every year during Belize for a stint to commercial lobster with my family and spend time with my family because I couldn't really, I was really broke, kind of just a complete fly fishing bum essentially, mm -hmm. you know, making very little money running a fly shop. So um, I couldn't really fly back and forth all the time to see my family. So I would spend that time in the Keys lobstering with them and kind of catch up on everything. And I just happened to be home. And a lady, um, Sue, from the Miami Herald wanted to write an article about females hunting, specifically hog hunting. So I, through my travels, had met Gray. And I had another friend that was also involved in this here at FOE and said, hey, guys, you know, what what would this look like if I came up and did this article? Would you guys be up for that? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. They invited me here. I'll never forget, you know, kind of it just it lit the fire again. Like I grabbed my bow, got in the truck with another friend of mine, Luke, and who's a photographer, and we wiggled up to FOE for the first time. And it just as soon as like we came through the gate, I was like, oh, I'm back. Like this is it. Like this is the best of both worlds. So now I can see myself in that space. And it was really hard. It was extremely hard to leave Belize. I love Belize. I, I loved, I had what I consider my family there, like people that I spent Christmases and Easter's and, you know, like people that really took me in. So it was, it was not an easy decision to leave and come back to Florida, but a huge part of who I am and what I you know, just your purpose and what you, what makes you feel alive. I love to guide and I love guiding fishing. And when Gray offered me the job and said, would you like, you know, to potentially come work for us and guide as well as do, you know, the marketing and websites and social media, et cetera, as well as kind of operate the lodge and, and manage that, um, you know, would you be interested in it? It just, it was really a no brainer. Like I, I just saw myself in that space. Like I, this is where I need to be. Hunting is such a huge part of my life too. And, and while it's not been a career for me per se or a profession until the last five years, because I've now morphed into a hunting guide as well mm -hmm. as a fishing guide. Um, it was definitely natural for that mm -hmm. to happen just with my background and how I grew up and and the same with this fishing, you know, it, I just walked into it. It wasn't that I woke up one day and I was like, I'm going to be a Osceola turkey guide. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely did not happen. But back to your childhood of enjoying those solitude moments and then also just enjoying the, the diversity and different textures that you experience from switching from tarpon to tree stands and to the Osceola, the turkey, to, you know, I heard you before reference it as the permit of the woods. Oh, yeah, definitely the permit <laughs> of the woods. I think you should woods. brand that. But, you know, I, I think that it's a neat full circle for you. Um, I'm assuming that you didn't get a chance to do much hunting in Belize. No, you know, well, that was another thing that was kind of 
my neighbors downstairs, um, Mr. Robbie and, and Miss Mina and their whole family that they all hunted like Miss Mina didn't, mm -hmm. but Mr. Robbie used to take, you know, his sons up farther up the island towards the Mexico, you know, kind of border essentially because Ambergris Key is, uh, you know, there's an imaginary line where it mm -hmm. becomes Mexico and they would go hunt white-tailed deer. They have a, a version of white-tailed deer and they also have and, you know, the gold turkey. So they they have all of that. They have a, a animal called a give nut as well. So even while I was in Belize, Mr. Robbie was, you know, throwing a whole leg, deer leg on the grill and smoking it for hours and feeding the whole mm -hmm. family. And I had a lot of interest in doing it, but he's like, it's not safe. It's not safe for, you know, a female to go with us up there. And while the invitation was probably there and I could have been like, no, I'm going to go, it really wasn't safe. And I, I figured that out while I was bone fishing one day with, with a, a client that came in the fly shop. He had fished a couple of days with, with uh, Trace Piscatos and he's like, hey, you know, I got the next day off. You, I know you got it off. You want to go walk the beach for bonefish? I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's go. So I took him up where I normally went but I went as far as we could go north and we went to the last dock with the water taxi. They dropped us off and we went as far as we could north and we just kept walking and walking. And at one point somebody was following me. Hmm. There were definitely guys in the woods that were cutting coconuts or with machetes and, and whatnot. And he was about 400 yards away from me and he started like waving his arms and he was like running at me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like what's going on? And he's like, those guys are following you and they very well people yeah. would kidnap yeah. you very easily, whether it was for money or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of scary, you know, and I, I kind of got humbled. Like, what, what did you do? He got closer to me and then we, we definitely got out of it. there. Yeah, yeah. Chucked it back. So, um, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it was a safety issue, but mm -hmm. they definitely hunt in Belize. They, mm -hmm. I just had one of the, the boys that, has now become a guide. His he comes from a long line of of guides out of El Pescador, and he just messaged me the other day. He's like, "Lace, I want to get a bow. What should I get?" And so we started talking about bows, and I'm gonna try to, at some point, the next person that I know that flies over, you mm -hmm. know, take a bow with them. That's and awesome. Give it to him. So that, that that's it is a kind of cool full circle thing. And even though you're not from Chieflin, it it's more back to the roots than what you were experiencing and. What to you has been the most helpful part about being here as a guide since you've been in two other contexts? So a lot of people guide and they stay in one context almost the whole time, they, sure. you know, but you've been in, this is your third. What, what's been the most helpful here at being a part of FOE? So the bar set really high, you know, at FOE, Gray definitely sets the bar high for what he expects from all of us. Um, I would say that half the guides I know personally or knew before or have some sort of connectivity before FOE. Mm -hmm. um, and then half of them I don't. So there's a healthy mix of, of all of us and different personalities and different guide level experiences. Um, but it's, it's a hard, I don't want to say it's hard in a bad context, but it's, it's hard to keep that standard so mm -hmm. high and to live up you know, to his standards, mm -hmm. essentially. So everyone here works incredibly hard. Um, the success, you know, lies in each one of us coming together and, and doing what needs to happen in order to make FOE shine. Because every client that walks through the doors here, they have some sort of contact with me because I do all of the reservations. So they know me or know of me or uh, have had some sort of interaction. But once I, you know, kind of check them in, I might be guiding, you know, someone in particular, or I might not be guiding at that moment and, and just making sure all the moving parts are working. Mm -hmm. But every client takes away what FOE is from that particular guide. So each, each one of us is the representation of what FOE is. It's not just me. It's not just Gray. It's not, you know, just Whitman, um, which were kind of the core that have been here the longest, I guess, together. But it's, you know, 
their experience with Brian or their experience with Parker or Ryan, you know, or Ron. So it's, I think that's important that you realize as a team in a, in a lodge setting that people, you have to be on your A game and, and these guys all are. So having that team that's able to, to really shine and, and to make FOE stand out is, is huge. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned when you were first getting your start and you were walking around the dock, people wouldn't speak to you or you had a hard time finding community, but yeah. what do you feel like made it different here that allowed you to find community? Some of them, like I said, I knew um, from guiding in Fort Myers. So, um, you know, like for example, Parker O'Bannon, he comes from a very um, long line of, of fishermen guides. His grandfather was one of the first guides ever in Southwest Florida. His dad is a, a world-renowned guide who's guided President Bush and had clients of that stature, you know, throughout his guide career. So his dad and my dad went to high school together. So he, it's, if you're in Fort Myers and you hear the Kelly family name, you're probably going to either associate it with hunting, fishing, or spearfishing. Okay. And knowing, you know, your background and, and kind of that, maybe that good old boys network kind of gives you a little bit of respect in a sense, I guess you could say. So coming out the gate here, I had a group of guys that already knew me. They already knew what I was capable of. Some of them, like Whitman, we used to guide alongside of each other. He used to call me for group trips, you know, especially like when we, he'd do big things for like Budweiser, Hooters, or, you know, whatever his sponsor was at the moment. Like I would be a part of that. So I think I had that background and that makes it easier for sure. Um, and all the new guys, uh, I think you just, you earn it as you go. You know, they mm -hmm. see, they see what I do in, in the background and also what I do guide wise, yeah. you know, they're there to experience it. When I tag out on a Turkey, they, they all get a hug on their neck and oh, I'm super stoked. And how was your day? And then we, you know, kind of shoot the, you know, back and forth. Yeah. So, um, I think you just earn it as you go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important just to be humble and, and to be, be able to say, you know, Hey, can you help me out here too? Yeah. be vulnerable and let it, let it come to you. In oh some yeah. Senses. There's yeah. definitely times where I'm like, guys, this isn't working. Like, mm -hmm. do you think I should use this striker? Like what, like, what am I doing wrong here? Yeah. So, um, and the same with fishing, like, why did you, you know, jump three today? And I only like fed one and we didn't even get it tight. So it's, I think you just, you got to keep learning and mm -hmm. you got to be, you never, especially as a female want to come into something like I'm, I'm the, you know, Alpha, God's yeah. gift to fly fishing or God's gift to guiding or yeah. whatever it may be. I think it's easy to talk about the challenges that women outdoorsmen have and not to minimize that at all. But there's also, I think maybe in some ways, some advantages in the sense of like, you know, you, you don't have some of these expectations placed on you to just, you know, I, I think sometimes even in, in the, the guide and outdoor world in general, you know, people just feel like they got to have it all together and they got to be tough and they got to, you know, be the alpha. And in some ways there's a little bit of an advantage to that in the sense that, you know, you're here, you got great community. And in some ways, you know, I think in the guide world, people see each other as competition, so they don't help each other. And in some ways you can kind of use that to your advantage and say, Hey, you know, Well, definitely. I, I, I certainly feel like that, you know, it's funny. I've never really thought about it, but guys in general want to help, mm -hmm. especially a female because they, I don't know if it's the woman in distress or whatever it may be like <laughs> scenario, <laughs> but, um, you you definitely as a girl mm -hmm. need to take advantage I don't want to say take advantage, but, um, utilize that resource that, mm -hmm. you know, guys are willing to, and a lot more willing to help you mm -hmm. than necessarily somebody that they size up as competition. Yeah, for sure. And so that's in your advantage a little bit. I Definitely. Mean, you know, there's obviously the challenges of community that, that you talked about, which 
you know, to, just to kind of transition to that as somebody who has two daughters, what I'm hoping is I, I told you is that my daughters, if they want to be a part of the outdoor and they want to fish and they want to hunt and stuff that they can just have the same opportunity to experience what I've experienced. And it's, we talked about, you know, a redfish doesn't care what race or gender you are. But one of the things that I love about the outdoors is the friendships and the relationship and the communities that I get to be a part of. And I think that's the thing that we kind of were talking about this morning. Definitely. That you want people, I, I want people to be able to take them serious and be able to, and, and so in a lot of ways, I know that's been something that's been close to your heart to be able to gain the respect. It is. And I find, you know, a lot of times I get a lot of clients, I get, especially in the fly side of my business, um, and, and really honestly, probably even in the hunting side now, I get the people that more so than not, I don't get the guys that are, I'm the best turkey hunter. Mm. I want to do this, this, and this. I get the, I've never turkey hunted before. Don't tell anybody, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I want to go with you because I feel more comfortable or mm. more at ease being a beginner. And I've noticed that in my fly fishing here and, and definitely starting over my book of business essentially because I was gone. And, and that's one thing when you leave, as a guide and you leave an area, you know, staying in contact with your old clients is, is a difficult thing and trying to pull them necessarily to where you are mm. now is, you know, it's definitely an art and something you have to work at very hard. So I had to pretty much start over since I, I stopped guiding over in Belize and there's only X amount of clients that came to visit me over there. And then starting over here, I found that m mainly, I would say half of my clientele are beginners they've mm -hmm. never caught a tarpon on fly and they're getting on my bow and feeling comfortable getting on my bow because i'm not looking down on them or putting them down for not being able to make a 50 foot cast consistently into the wind mm -hmm. and and just really teaching and and becoming a little bit more of a teacher in a sense than just mm -hmm. guiding them to fish yeah what other challenges outside of just the community piece do you feel like women who are wanting to be serious outdoorsmen are experiencing? Oh God, that's like a can of worms you just opened. <laughs> but I can't, I can't sit down with you and not ask it, you know? I mean, I feel like it's, it's something on my mind, you know? I see, I'm, I'm all for the fact that, um, and I, I hate to keep bringing it up because it is a hot topic or whatever. And probably the horse has been beat a little bit on different podcasts and whatnot. But being trying to get some somewhere too fast as a female outdoorsman um, with social media. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't have you don't have the for one, the respect or the knowledge mm -hmm. to be being put up on an ad or an ambassadorship or whatever, whatever it may be being promoted when you're not when you haven't necessarily earned that right to be there. Mm -hmm. um, other than the amount of followers that you have and the amount of likes that you have. And I think it's a, it's been a beautiful thing to encourage participation in the outdoors as females and it's our our you know demographics definitely growing and i think that it's a direct result of that because it's kind of like the cool thing or the end thing to be you know this whatever whether it's a hunting personality mm -hmm. or fishing personality that's a female um but what i've what i kind of get sad about or what i i see different because i i was into the industry before social media came around. Mm -hmm. I had just started to put my feet in the water and I remember how hard it was back then mm. to get any sort of notoriety or any sort of sponsorship. And now it's just dished out to whoever has, it's a popularity contest. Whoever looks legit. I mean, whoever looks legit yeah. and they have no, they have very little, um, a reason to vet the people that they endorse because on paper on the internet it it looks like they know what they're doing but until you have that 
human interaction and you actually go pull somebody around and put them in front of a tarpon, you, you know, if, if you're trying to be promoted as a, a fly fishing guide, um, you don't really have, they don't really know who you are or what you're capable mm-hmm. of. So I think it's a company's responsibility more so than any time ever to be not only picking and promoting the people that really actually know what they're doing, but also to not overlook the people that maybe mm. are not on social media and not worried about how many posts they're going to make today. Yeah. And it, there's a, a it's a slippery slip because it's a great thing and it's encouraging a lot of girls to become guides. Um, but then I also see the flip side of that where a lot of them promote themselves like they're captain so-and-so or they're, you know, a guide out west or whatever it may be. And it's it's a – but they're not actually doing it. Yeah. And I think there might be like a, a good heart behind it. Like, oh, we hope that we see more people come in the – women come in the industry. And I heard a stat the other day, something like 48% of new fisher fishermen are, are women. Um, which is awesome. Which is awesome. And I don't know if that stat is – I don't know where that stat comes from. And then I also talked to Tom Rosenbauer from Orvis and he shared some stats with me that is concerning about people coming into fishing in general, like that there's not enough young people coming into fishing and it might feel different because of social media, but statistically there's, and and it's challenging to, to actually like get good data and assess all that. I was about to say like, how do you really engage that? Because that, so I take it with a grain of salt, but I think back to the, I think there's like a, a good intent behind it. Definitely. But the reason that you are where you are today is not because you saw an ambassador on a social media post. It's because you experienced the outdoors because your dad worked to to show you those things. Absolutely. And I think we just can't lose sight of that. And it, it, there's nothing that will. I'm all for trying to reach new people, but the the way that my girls are going to experience it, it has nothing to do with screens. We don't even have TV or anything. Like they don't have phones or you know, but like is going to be through just if I take them out and they like it, they like it. And if they don't, that's fine. They don't. And And we can't lose sight of that though. We we cannot lose sight of that. It's, it's very vitally important that, that that's a, a, but I, it all comes back to the company's responsibilities and who puts the faces out there and who backs somebody potentially up with, you know, sponsorship or with, Mm -hmm. you know, putting them in, in the limelight. So I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll be here still hunting and fishing (laughs) before and I'll (laughs) still be there after social media. Yeah. I've kind of personally, I've kind of backed off of it Mm -hmm. a lot and because it's, it's becoming noticeable to me that people are starting to associate it with less respect. Yeah. And there's, I definitely think people are leaning away from it. Um, could, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, for like, for example, where, where I'm guiding in the nature coast area, you will not see me posting jump shots of tarpon and, you know, redfish pictures. And I really gauged that back because for one, it can ruin a fishery. It could definitely, you know, you make one post when all of the tarpon come in and you'll no, look around and notice that there are twice as many boats on the water. It's a no-brainer. People are going to, you know, now with the invention of, you know, all of the electronics and all of the things that we have to get us from A to B, it's not hard necessarily. It's not as hard as it was 20 years ago to put yourself in front of fish. We have all the advantages, but keeping spots and keeping even when things are going off a little bit more secret and a little bit kind of reserved and amongst your Mm -hmm. group of your inner circle, I think is really important because myself included, certain people in certain boats that are recognizable can certainly ruin a spot. And Mm -hmm. people, I I know it happened to me over and over again, especially in Fort Myers where I was guiding 
every single day nearly, you know, close to 200 and some days on the water with clients and then the mix of, you know, scouting and everything in between, people would look over and say, oh, well, that's that girl. That's that, that's that lacy girl. They can see my blonde hair, you know, and see that I'm a girl from a long ways away, yeah. know exactly where I am and go fish that spot the next day or beat me to yeah. the spot with my clients. So kind of, you know, aside from like wearing some sort of disguise when you're out there and changing your <laughs> boat color every day, you've got to be careful about when you fish certain spots and, yeah. and protecting your little box of knowledge and, and what you know and keeping it safe because pressure does ruin fisheries. It, it most it certainly does. I've seen it firsthand and a, a huge reason why I did not move back to Fort Myers to guide. I would have been so easy for me to the snap of a finger you know, my fingers just to go, all right, well, I'm back from Belize. I'm going to go back to guiding full time in Fort Myers. But I, it got so overpressured for me mm -hmm. that I, I needed a new space and I needed to get away from all of that. So I've treated this completely differently. Whereas in Fort Myers, I was probably more active and posting things and when tarpon were jumping and I think there's certain fisheries where you can kind of probably get away with that because the pressure's already there. Mm -hmm. But places like Homosassa and, you know, Ozello and Crystal River, they don't have a ton of people, one, because it's treacherous, and two, we just don't have the population size. So you might come here, you might throw your boat in the water, think, I'm going to go fish Homosassa, and within a few minutes, you know, tear off your lower unit because it's scary out there. It's, yeah. it's like a bunch of landmines. It's not an easy fishery to learn and it's, it can definitely be expensive in order to learn it per yeah. se. So we have that going for us, but still with sure. electronics and with, you know, everything progressing with technology, it's easier for people to get from A to B. It's e easier for people to figure things out. So trying to protect that personally is, is even more important to me every single year and mm -hmm. and not trying to blast out there like oh the tarpon fishing's hot granted as from a business standpoint that's going to create you know charters for me so it's a it's a very double-edged sword you know you've got to put a little bit out of there just to try to gain new charters and new especially as a guide starting all over again and and creating a new book of business but at the same time I don't want to ruin it for all the other guides that have been there just because I'm trying to gain business and putting up, you know, tarpon fishing's hot. Mm -hmm. Y'all need to come right now. Then you look around and it's Lacey's fault that there's, you know, 25 extra boats on top of each other that are now educated about what the tarpon are doing. And I think most people are feeling that that pressure across the board. And something that we were talking about over coffee earlier this morning was, um, I think something that is missed in the conversation around social media. So like, there's a lot of, you know, everybody's kind of saying the same thing. Like, you know, it's, it's root and fishery or people who copy in spots or expectations, but something I think is missed is that there's a veil that people put up this wall and they, they it's, there's no vulnerability. And I think in some ways, that can be an issue because if young Lacey, you know, 18, 19, 20, starting her career Lacey, were to see some of the stuff that's put out in today's social media world, you actually might be discouraged because you don't see some of the behind the scenes challenges or some of the tearful moments. Oh, Could gosh. you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I'm, I'm kind of interested in that. I remember, you know, I was primarily a bait guide um, in Fort Myers and there were so many mornings where I couldn't get it done. I could not cast net the proper bait to go do what I needed to do in order to put a certain amount of fish in, in people's hands in order to be successful. And there was definitely times where I had to use that network that, that I needed, you know, to back me up at that moment and, and just be able to make things work. But the tears were there. I mm -hmm. mean, gosh, I can't even probably definitely can't even count the amount of times that I felt defeated before I really even started the, the day and even picked up my client. So, um, and as a new guide and, and you don't 
it, it's all glamorized. Like you don't necessarily see that from people's social media. You don't see the ins and outs of, you know, maybe you did bust your lower unit up and, and now you can't afford to fix it in order to take, and you've got to borrow a buddy's boat and maybe you broke something on your buddy's boat and you're just going backwards. And, and so there's, there's so many challenges in order to become successful and, and it's really persistence over anything and being just, you have to have really thick skin. You have to be able to get beat down and, and stand right back up and just keep going and just keep going until you kind of get over that hump of, you know, now I have a nut because I just ran, you know, a hundred tarpon trips in a row and I have you know, a safety net in case I rip off my lower unit now. But as a new guide, that struggle is very real and it's very personal. So you just can't give up. And and it does weed out the week for sure. I definitely think it does. But, you know, social media doesn't allow people to actually see the nitty gritty. And, and the you know, very few people ever post anything that's like, bad person yeah you know or just vulnerable like it's it's face grabs and mm -hmm. tailing redfish and i think in some ways too we get, go back but you know starting pre-social media you, you in some ways there's some advantages to that that i think people face today and um i definitely would would we could sit there probably all day. Oh, totally. You know, we, we definitely need to do a part two too just to talk more about the future of hopefully women in the outdoor industry because you know, guides build their business, hopefully, off the desire to help people experience the outdoors. And you don't want to cut 50% of the population off because they're not the right gender. You definitely. Know? Um, and so we, we could definitely sit and talk about that a long time too. But I'd love just to transition into some fun rapid fire questions. Sure. Go ahead. Cool. All right. Rapid fire question. The first one, I feel like this might be an easy one, but maybe one day we'll actually do this for some of the answers. But if you could have one thing put on a billboard for everybody to see, what would it be? No more development in Florida. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> I'm just yeah. kidding. Don't Not move really. here. Don't move here. Oh, that would it's actually scary. be funny. If we could have like a a, a billboard on just every major entrance. like a bunch of snakes entrance. and gators and like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't move here. Don't That's move a here. pretty honest one. I had somebody the other day say book and then he put his website on there. <laughs> nice, <laughs> so nice. It's about nicely as done. honest as it gets. Um, what do you think is missing in the guide culture? What is missing? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> um, What's something you'd like to see be, be added into the way that captains and guides are carrying themselves today? More respect for their, the guides that have been before them. Hmm. I think that it's, I think it's fairly easy to look around and especially in this fishery that I can see firsthand that, um, you know, the older guides are, their clients are dying off. They may not have new clients coming in and there's maybe a disconnect between, um, you know, just kind of not running them over, but just not, not having the amount of respect I feel like they should have for the older guides. Yeah, I've never thought about that. Somebody that's on the back, you know, back nine of their career and how they've obviously know what they're doing, but they have a lot of clients who are aging out. It's it's a it's a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a problem that I've had older guides come mm -hmm. to me and say, "How do you do this uh, social media thing or, mm -hmm. you know, how do I get on the internet? Yeah. <laughs> Can you help me with a website? Because they don't, they have no clue on how to generate new business. Yeah. I've noticed that. I just have never, that was a light bulb moment for me. I never really thought about that. Um, how have you found to be the best way to learn a new fishery? Do it yourself. Don't take a rod. Hmm. Go pull. Go work shorelines, go sit, go watch, go wait. I mean, if you're if you're at still at the point where every time you go out and you're so called scouting and all you're worried about is 
catching a fish, you're missing so much more that mm. you could be learning. You need to study the patterns of what they're doing on what tides and, and why and what moons and phases and wind direction and so forth. So, um, you know, something that I think is, is vitally important is going out there and just observing, observing everything mm. and not be so concerned about you yourself if, if you need to go catch another redfish on fly, you yourself, you probably shouldn't be guiding anybody. Don't get me wrong. I think that's great. And I think we all have that itch still and, and you should, and you should want to go. But when you're trying to learn a new fishery, especially like you need to, to really just sit and observe and move around and figure it out what's going on with the fishery and, and what the fish are doing first. What do you think is the brightest part of the future of outdoor women in the outdoor industry? That there's more of us. Hmm. That it there's the community is growing. That it's becoming something that isn't just a few select. It's not just a niche market anymore. It's it's becoming. A voice, you know, that's mm-hmm. necessary in the in the industry. So it's it's pretty cool that there's more and more women getting into it and feeling comfortable. And there's more resources. Thank goodness for the internet and social media to connect the dots. Because you know, one thing that I I always try to tell aspiring female guides that ask me for advice is that you have to forget that you're a female per se when you want to become a guide you're Mm -hmm. just a guide just like every other guide so finding those dots that you can connect you know through those resources that are now being put out there and that are easy you know to attain whereas when i was coming up and when i started guiding i had to rely on people like my dad um you know my my husband or my brother or my friends you know that that could help me and steer me in the right direction. So um, I think it's it's becoming easier to attain the information without having to rely on somebody else as much. What is the most helpful tip you could give somebody who wants to catch a permit? <laughs> the most helpful tip. go slam your fingers in the door like a couple of like eight times and and then think about how much you still want to catch a permit. That's yeah. no, I'm just kidding. Um, it, it can be incredibly frustrating. So just obviously you have to have a lot of patience. Yeah. Um, don't set yourself up for success before you've been defeated multiple times. Hmm. Like don't feel like every I, of course, you want to feel like every time you go permit fishing, you're going to catch a permit, but your expectations have to be reasonable. And until you've done it for a while, you'll realize that it's it's an art per se, and it everything can go wrong and everything will go wrong at some point. So just set yourself up to always continue to learn. And even when you think you've got it figured out, realize that you're still learning because you haven't their permit <laughs> <laughs> their permit their permit that's on a billboard mm-hmm. um what's your favorite wild game dish i'm gonna have to go with turkey i like osceola turkey i've never eaten any other turkeys but mm. i love some fried turkey nuggets mm. like fried chicken what do you dip them in i do an egg egg wash and mm. then i coat them with the light like rice flour or something light and uh and fry them up, and that's probably one of my favorites. I like. I like that too, but I I like to. There's like a. I have a friend who makes this dip that I don't really even know what it is. It's like some sort of like <laughs> mayonnaise. Like it's like some version between like Chick Fil A sauce and the Zaxby mm. sauce. So it has that color to it. Yeah. And he he does a big staff party for the church staff. And nice. He always has wild game, and he always has turkey, and it's so good. I like the white meat. I like quail. I like mm. to eat some fried quail. Pretty, pretty much anything fried. Mm. Um, What's your least favorite dish? Hmm. I don't do like livers or like mm. anything like that. I'm not into the organs. People are like, there's just some trend about eating the deer's tongue. And I'm like, you guys can have that. Yeah. I, cool. I ate <laughs> beef tongue on a taco the other day. 
and it was really See, good. You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that hungry. Yeah. I, 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 I grew up with a dad who ate, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the organs, you know, but, and I didn't think much about it, but I never heard the tongue. Yeah. Grown up. I mean, my great grandfather liked to eat all sorts of weird stuff. Yeah. Like he ate turtles. They grew up in Fort mm -hmm. Myers beach yeah. and, um, all sorts of like weird livers and hearts. Well, and they eat turtles over in Asia like crazy so, so bad apparently that, they're delicious but yeah. you know so, well, obviously so bad. People we can't grow sustain them here. that people grow them here and illegally smuggle them to, I believe that and it's actually like a really big illegal animal trade out of Florida it's like they'll bust people and they'll have like hundreds of turtles in their backyard oh and that makes me so sad yeah because I it's love turtles yeah I know they're, they're just really chill just minding their own business but uh, well, they're not really chill because if you think about every time you see a turtle and especially during tarpon season, they come up and they go. <gasps> oh, yeah. I, I was thinking more of like the river turtles. But yeah, y'all have a lot of turtles in Homosassa and just anywhere that you yeah. tarpon fish. If you see the there's definitely a direct correlation yeah. to whatever the turtles are eating. The tarpon are probably eating, too. Yeah. But I feel like they're always in a nightmare. No, they're like well, every time they come up, they're like, <gasps> no, they're always surprised. You <laughs> yeah. know, like they're floating 10 feet from the boat and then they're floating there and you, you always get to see them. You're like, oh, there's a turtle and then they always see you after them which is very unlikely in most outdoor things like most animals are gonna if maybe you're it's their shell maybe they just can't see back I that know, that's i think they're just aloof but uh <laughs> the last one is for you what does success look like for you 10 to 20 years down the road you know guiding i just i that's my passion and what i want to do um I dabble in some other things like, mm -hmm. you know, managing some social media stuff and websites and whatnot. Um, but guiding is definitely where my heart is. And I've never made a lot of money doing it necessarily. Um, it's always just been a labor of love. So I'm not in it for, you know, necessarily to try to it's not some get rich quick scheme yeah. by any means. If you think it is, then don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you need to sell term life insurance. Yes, <laughs> I did that I at one point too. <laughs> I feel like almost everybody did that at one point. <laughs> yeah, I drank the blue punch on that one. But yeah, um, yeah I think just continuing to, to reach um, more and more people through mm -hmm. guiding and that connectivity. I really, I've created lifelong friends and people that I consider family just, you know, from our relationship from guiding them in the outdoors. So I don't expect to be doing anything anything different necessarily. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And as somebody who has daughters, you know, thank you for being vulnerable and, and genuine and not being fake or obsessed with the image and just actually loving the outdoors. It shows through. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective. I'm excited about our upcoming lineup and I'm grateful for your support. We're still new at this, so we'd love to hear from you. You can find out how to contact us by visiting us at captainscollective.com. Please keep sharing the word about the podcast and we will see you soon. This is the Captain's Collective.